Good morning, treasure hunters and explorers. Today I want to talk about a topic that I've been thinking about for a while. About how the Jesuits played some shenanigans with the petroglyphs. And I want to talk about the native groups and some of the other groups of people that came here from different parts of the world and how they influenced the native groups and how they were possibly integrated into these groups and affected their cultural, religion, history, and technologies. I have a few new t-shirt designs on my merchandise store. Uh, I have a val funny Valentine's t-shirt and design on mugs and things you can check out. Um, I also have a couple other new designs that are pretty cool that I think you might like. And this really helps my channel to be able to keep doing these videos and and put forth the effort to bring this information to you. Anyway, if you like this video, please like, share it, and subscribe to it. And uh, I'll keep putting out great content as, as I have time and as I can. Anyway, the Jesuits were here earlier than any of the other Spanish groups. They were the first uh, religious groups that were here. They were endorsed by the crown, by the Pope, and they had huge missions and they established mines, uh, fields, crops, had all kinds of things going on not only to support the mission but also to bring money and things in for the crown and for the church and so whether or not they wanted to admit they were involved in mining, one of the main ways that they got, one of the main ways they made money was through mining activities. And as time went on, I think the Jesuits became more and more powerful. They gained more and more wealth. They had people that were scattered out across the area that they were over, their mission, their particular mission, that were engaged in different activities. And they had to be endorsed by the mission or specifically by the crown to be able to operate legally. Now this doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of illegal operations going on because of human nature and the vast wilderness in the remote area, remoteness of the area. I'm sure there were just as many illegitimate operations going on as there were legitimate. But they weren't able to operate with the same level of uh, success as those that were operated by the priests and the, the Jesuits. Now the Jesuits eventually did fall out of favor with the, the Pope and first of all with, with, the, with the king and then he persuaded the Pope and they were Jesuits were put down for a period of time. And while the Jesuits were were put down the Franciscans came in and took over the missions and the mines and the areas that the Jesuits had. But the Jesuits being out into the lands and having Indian contacts and having runners and, and uh, organized missions and things, they got word that they were going to be displaced long before the soldiers ever arrived to es escort them back to Mexico. And so they had a lot of time to, to hide up their caches, to hide up their wealth. And I know that they did that. We've been able to find some sites that can only be attributed to the Jesuits. And these sites are cache sites. These sites are hidden, hidden mines and documents. I believe that there were documents that they had... A, that were associated with these mines that were also hidden so they wouldn't be revealed or brought back with all their materials to the to the Mexico and to where the uh, authorities that were there to inspect and take over the things that the Jesuits had. Now one of the ways that the Jesuits operated secretly was they made good friends with the, with the Native Americans the Jesuits were always on better terms with the Native Americans than the Franciscans, at least in the beginning. Um, 
the Jesuits were on the front end of, you know, they were there first, and so the Indians really didn't know what their mode of operation was going to be, and they were had pretty good relations for a number of years, and one thing that did set apart the Franciscans and the Jesuits was that I do believe the Jesuits were friendlier with and nicer to the Indians, and it shows in some of the memorials and things like that. For instance, Father Tino um, has been memorialized and accepted by many of the tribes in the desert southwest, and and yet when the Franciscan um, friar who came after him, when the later Franciscan priest took over Aquino's mission, that was Junipero Sierra, the Indians did not like him at all. And after he was died and there was monuments and statues and stuff put up around, they tore a lot of them down. And a lot of them have been defaced and even even to this day, Father Kino has a lot more respect than Junipero Sierra. And it might have been because of the way that the Franciscans treated the, in, the Native Americans, treated the Indians. The French Jesuits actually treated the Native Americans much better than the Spanish Jesuits did. And that is one of the reasons why the early English settlers uh, had a difficult time with the Native Americans up around the French-Canadian border was because the French had befriended the Indians and the Jesuits worked with the Indians rather than against them. And the Native Americans that were dealing with the settlers and the, the pioneers uh, weren't being dealt with and treated as partners, they were being treated as adversaries and I think that's why there was a lot of tensions in the eastern settlers and the Indians felt like they were encroaching on them because they didn't work with the Indians and make treaties and make friends with them the way the French did. And one of the things that the, I think that the Jesuits did learn was they did learn some of the Native American languages and I think they had a big interest in the petroglyphs. I've seen a lot of petroglyph sites that, that I have a difficult time determining whether they were done by the Jesuits or by the Native Americans. But because of some of the topics found in these petroglyphs, I do believe they were Jesuit. You know, the Native Americans didn't use the Spanish cross. They didn't use the heart shape. They didn't use like the horse, or treasure symbols, or crown symbols. They didn't use, they didn't have the same siglas that, that, that were used by the Spanish. And I think the Spanish, or the, the Jesuits, hid some of the meanings in their treasure cache panels by making them appear to be Native American petroglyph panels. You know, it, it it's kind of makes sense that if you were a Jesuit and you wanted to leave some information, if you cloaked that as a Native American panel, and yet you had the documentation or the key that explained what that meant, or you learned from the Native Americans what that meant, and you changed things so that the Native Americans didn't understand fully what it meant, and the Spanish didn't understand what it meant, but you did. And that's kind of what I think the Jesuits did, is they, they hybridized um, the petroglyphs with their own meanings and created kind of their own type of glyphs. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the other groups of people that came here. Starting from the West Coast, we know the Vikings came here. We suspect that some of the Egyptians, Cleopatra's son, uh, may have come here. They have found some artifacts that seem to be have Egyptian influences. Um, we have the Madoc, which was the Welsh prince that we have evidence came here. We have later, at a later time, we have evidence that the Knights Templars 
escaping from the persecutions of the crowns in the Europe, came across from Scotland and landed on the American shores and brought with them some of the more priceless treasure. At least that's what the information in some of the records and some of the things that's been uncovered point to. Coming down even further, we have evidence of the Greeks or the Indo-Greeks uh, coming here. There's been old Greek coins found. There's been um, architecture that looks that the Spanish called um, Castilian. Whether that was from early Iber people from the Iberian Peninsula that predate the actual kingdoms of Spain and Portugal. But we have petroglyph panels on the American continent that match petroglyph panels, information panels in the old world. And one of these I've shown in several of my videos. It's the um, of the underground cities, uh, the legend of um, Copala and Cibola and the seven cities of gold. I believe that this petroglyph panel ties into that. And I believe that when these people from the Iberian, the early Iberians came here, that they saw this seven cities and they were so impressed with it that they took that information back, created a petroglyph panel, pass that information down, whether in writing or to their ancestors, and this is what set Columbus on his course to get um, endorsed and supported by the king and the queen of Spain and put together an exploration party to come across and look for this land of Cibola, this underground city that was written about, talked about in earlier records. Now this information was kept secret amongst the wealthy, amongst the elite, amongst those that were in the higher class. This wasn't something that, that was allowed to leak down into the lower class. And so that's why you don't see a lot of information about it. You have to really dig deep and get into the history of it before you start finding that evidence. We have evidence that possibly Madoc or um, somebody else came down and, and interacted with the Aztecs. The Aztecs for a period of time, it, 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 at least in history, it seems to point to that they, didn't, they, they weren't doing human sacrifice until a certain point. They started all of a sudden doing human sacrifice. And their culture changed significantly. I believe that their, their technology of living out in a marsh, out in a lake, was established from when they lived at Lake Kapala, but it seems like that their practice of human sacrifice and things was not practiced among the Paiute, the Ute, the Goshute, the Wallapai, the Havasupai, all these groups that are that are uh, Uto-Aztecan tribes, they didn't have this same tradition of human sacrifice. They pulled off or these these little groups left the main core before this practice started because this practice wasn't known to or practiced among these groups. We don't see it in the petroglyphs, we don't see it in their ethnologies, in their verbal histories. It seems like they they had some kind of influence and from another group that started them down this path. And when we think about it, there's really only a couple of groups that could have influenced them that way. In my opinion, I mean from my research, and I've done a lot of deep research. And the first group that comes to mind and has been talked about a lot is the Egyptian, the Egyptians. Now, you know, I have some friends and colleagues that have a strong opinion about the Egyptians, but the Egyptians had the technology, they had boats, they had the ability to send out a, uh, expeditions and to launch different uh, parties of men and, and people because of the great wealth of the, the uh, pharaohs. And one thing that the Egyptians did have, and that many years before or some of the earliest known records of, is human sacrifice. And they worshipped the sun god. And their sacrifices were done 
and their sacrifices were done in much the same way as the Aztecs started doing them. The Aztec worshipped the sun god, just like the Egyptians did, and the Egyptians would lay them on the altar and cut their heart out the same way that the Aztec did. And so I suspect that there's a possible connection or influence there that the Aztec didn't have when they left their homeland of Kapala and um, Lake Kapala. Well, the other civilization that I have evidence of that came to America was the ancient Chinese, the Chinese and Mongol people from Northern Asia. Now these people came here early. I mean they came here in like 200 BC and following they were looking for a volcano god and when I think it was Zhu Fu who was the um, magician that was put in charge of this group he was sent back with a bunch of Chinese prisoners to make a sacrifice to the volcano god so the Chinese obviously could see the volcanic clouds in the air moving across the earth they knew there was a volcano going on and they sent this magician with these slaves to make a human sacrifice across the ocean. And they said they went to the east and they, they went so many Chinese miles and when you do the math it ends up on the west shore of the United States. And we have evidences with a different early, the way the Chinese constructed some of their early walls. We have an example of that on the east coast of California. We have some examples of that near the Grand Canyon. And so if they did come into this region, it's almost certain that they ran into the other large group in the area, which would have been the Aztec. And because the Chinese were obviously doing human sacrifice to this fire god, that could have influenced the Aztec in their own to start this human sacrifice to gain power or you know, who knows what these cultures talked about, discussed when they came into contact with each other. And, and so those are the two possible connections to human sacrifice that we don't see prior to the Aztecs coming to, a Me to Mexico and building on um, Lake Texcoco and uh, building their city, Tenochtitlan, and doing all the things that they did it, it seems like the human sacrifice was something that started quite suddenly from an outside influence. We do know that when the Spanish when the Spanish showed up, they were you know upset, abhorred by what they saw the Aztecs doing, and that was part of the reason that led to them having no sympathy and and for actually destroying the Aztec. But before they they were destroyed as a nation, the Aztec when they saw what the Spanish were doing, they sent back priests and runners to take their prized treasures, their records, anything they could get a hold of that was most important to them, and they sent it back towards their old homeland to areas, probably places they had already cached things, places they had already lived, and the most secure and safe location for that stuff, for that treasure for their records for that information would have been in a cave, in a protected dry cave underground where the elements were not able to get to it. And I believe that's what they did, that they came back, they already knew where these caves were, they put information and this treasure in these caves, maybe they hit them up, sealed them up, I don't know, but they were, they, they left special petroglyphs on the ground that we call the key glyphs to guide them so that they could get back to these treasures and to these locations at some future point or later point in history. So anyway, that's my, my view on these different cultures. I think you can see in the petroglyph panels how that there are different influences from different cultures. I've shown some of the petroglyphs that look like Chinese. Um, the uh, Chinese seals of their realms. Um, the Chinese writing, you can see um, in some of the older petroglyphs, you can see runes. I have seen hooked X's in petroglyph panels. 
Maybe it was the Knights Templars that done. Maybe it was the Knights Templar that made these hooked X's, and maybe it was the actual Templars themselves that established, that moved in with and became part of some of these Native American groups. I have seen things that look like um, Egyptian writings, and you know there's a lot of really cryptic ancient petroglyphs over by Kanab um, in one area in one of the canyons over there where they dug down looking for some Aztec treasure for some Aztec things they uncovered some red-haired giants some giant individuals that were down in some caves and cysts and I think that if my memory serves me right they were like 13 feet down so there had been a lot of sediment blown in there but these where they found these giants in these cysts, they found a unique petroglyph style that was writing or runes. And so there's a lot of petroglyphs that can be dated by the depth and the location of them across the United States. And one of the reasons that the Western United States has been such a good place for petroglyphs is because how dry it is and pieces of stone are easier to write in and all the overhangs and the caves and things that the Native Americans could get into and these different groups of people could get into and preserve things, preserve their petroglyphs were petroglyphs and pictographs were their writing. That was that was their means and method of passing on the information that they had to their children. It was a language. It's not gibberish and it's not art, even though some of the things are quite artistic. It was more important information. It was more important information that they wanted passed on to their succeeding generations. If you have any questions or comments, leave a question or comment below. If you have any information that you've come across that might be of interest to us, uh, please let us know. And uh, thanks and have a great day.